The, uh, the subject matter, I have to say, is a, a bit of a crusade on my part. That uh, for about the last 10 years, I was doing quality assurance. And what I was seeing crossing my, the, 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 the table in the conference room were a lot of prospects where the reservoir was well described, the structure was well described, the chart system was worked on extensively, and there was literally nothing done about the seal. And in retrospect, what I was seeing was an awful lot of, of prospects which were, were incompletely evaluated. And in look back, I was seeing wells which in reality should never have been drilled in the first place. There are a number of reasons uh, why I was seeing this. This is sort of the, the traditional kind of view of how risk is proportioned in prospect evaluation. And, and historically this is true. When I was growing up as a young punk geologist, we were making our maps on 2D seismic. We were lucky if we had a grid. Uh, aliasing and correlation problems were de rigor. And of course, the maps were contoured by hand. So they had a bit of always artistic license to them. And so there was always big uncertainty whether or not you really actually had a closure. That was the big risk. Well, of course, with the, the advent of 3D, that really isn't true anymore. And you may still have uncertainty, but you're pretty darn sure that you really do have a closure. And where the risk has moved is really into the seal component. Uh, I was in a, a presentation a couple of years ago, this is from Schlumberger, where they did a look back of 20 of their uh, customers, I guess you would say, and what were their, their opinions. And out of this, you see that the, the, the result was that 45% of the dry holes were explained as seal failures. Now, uh, at least to my knowledge, Schlumberger has not published this look back. But there is one which is published by Exxon, just came out last year, where it's a full decade worth of their dry holes. And their results really are pretty identical to what Schlumberger was saying. That on average, about half the dry holes are from seal failures. But actually, even more telling, if you're in a circumstance where you are in a proven play, where the, where the hydrocarbon, the charge system, is pretty well understood, like in the Gulf of Mexico, then in that case, actually 60% of the dry holes are caused by seal failures. Now, given this shift to, to where the risk is sitting in your prospect, you would hope that you would see this reflected in the workflow. But the truth is, you don't. That, that 3D has made it quicker and simpler and easier to do the correlation, and of course making the contour map is the push of a button. But we can now do amplitudes and inversions and isolate geobodies, and that's what we do. And therefore, the vast majority of the time that I saw it being spent in, in prospect evaluations was still being spent here on mapping. And everything else, including the seal, if it was looked at at all, was done at the last moment in a hurry up mode and very, very incomplete. Now, there are a number of other things which also complicate <coughs> the effort to do a seal evaluation. And one of the, the unfortunate or inconvenient truths, to steal that phrase, is there's actually very little consensus about what is an effective seal, how to evaluate it, and how you would go about risking the results. And to try to, to illustrate the truth behind this, uh, just a couple of slides. Uh, EAG has a biannual uh, conference on seals. And back in 2012, they did a poll of the attendees. 
So what you have to imagine is everybody there pretty much is a structural geologist. And everybody there pretty much deals routinely with seal issues, seal evaluation. And the questions here really don't matter which questions I pulled, because what I really want to show is what happened with the answers. And on every single question on technique and, and, and in theory that they were asking, a very large fraction would say yes, which is what's in blue. A very large fraction would say no, which is in red. And then another large fraction would say either I don't know or beats the hell out of me. And that's the part in orange. And it really showed how little agreement there were within this community. Uh, another example of this kind of thing is if you go to the literature and you look to see what, on the subject of fault seal, what the Exxon specialists say and what the Shell specialists say, what you see is they're actually diametrically opposed to each other, with one exception. They both say that this is based on extensive and comprehensive look-back studies. <laughs> <coughs> now, there's one further thing that complicates it. And the illustration here, I, I would bet this might be the most widely and often referenced studies and diagrams in all of structural geology. If it's not the most referenced, I would be confident to say it's probably in the top 10. Now, what is it? Uh, it's the report of a study, oops, sorry, and it's looking at, in the North Sea, at, uh, uh, on this axis, a measurement of an estimate of how much clay is in the fault gouge and then on this axis, it simply is 29 faults in 13 fields, and whether or not, sorry, whether or not those faults were holding a column. So it's calibrating the clay, an estimate, a guess, of the clay content of the fault seal, and is it going to seal yes or no? That's all it is. Now, it's only 13 fields, and they're not even in the same play. So they're mixing apples and oranges. So any statistician would tell you that this is not a statistically meaningful sample, right? Now, this is not to reflect on Graham Fielding, by the way. Why, though, then, is this still the most referenced figure in all of structural geology? It's because it's the only one. <laughs> Now, that doesn't mean there hasn't been a lot of work done. Indeed, there has. You know, a lot of the majors have, have had research groups studying seal phenomenon. I know for a fact Shell, for instance, has been doing this for three decades. BP has a big group. Chevron has a big group. Exxon has a big group. They've done tremendous amount of work. There's an ongoing uh, research consortium from uh, Rock Deformation Research in Leeds which has also been running at least a decade, none of that work has ever been published. So the, the, the bottom line is that SEAL evaluation is actually an extremely poorly referenced field of study. There may be thousands, if you go to Google and, and put in SEAL, you probably get thousands, hundreds of thousands of hits out of this, only a very, very tiny fraction is actually really meaningful. Okay, so the bottom line is for the state of the art, is that quite often what would simply happen is evaluators don't know what it is they actually need to evaluate. So this is a stumbling block, I have to say. Okay, so what are some of the technical issues that you really would have to deal with if you're doing an evaluation. Uh, obviously, in 45 minutes, I, I, I can't spell it all out. I need a couple of days to do that. 
Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll at least go through a, a few of the issues, a few of the high points, maybe some of the more interesting bits. Uh, the first thing, the first starting point, of course, is what are the common ways in which SEALs can fail? And, and I would guess or say these five are probably the most common. Uh, the good news is that these are independent, for the most part, independent phenomenon with their own physics. So in any one particular play, you probably only have to evaluate one of these things. So the simplest and the one which is probably the best understood is capillary pressure seals. This is the shale which is sitting as your top seal on top of your prospect. The, the phenomenon is that you have, of course, some porosity and permeability within that shale, even though it may be very low. And what prevents the hydrocarbon from entering that shale is the interfacial tension between the hydrocarbon and the water which is saturating your seal. And the buoyancy of your hydrocarbon column has to exceed the value of that interfacial tension before it can begin to penetrate and leak through the seal. Um, the interfacial tension is going to depend on the composition of the hydrocarbon and the, the, the pore size of the porosity, which in practical terms means the clay content, the siltiness, the compaction, things like this. The math behind this is, is really Pretty easy, pretty simple. Uh, the fun bit is what happens when the seal fails. There's a neat experiment, and, and unfortunately, I don't have this as a video, and I wish I did. So what you're looking at is a wire mesh pasta strainer. And it is upside down in an aquarium, which is full of water and air is being pumped into the bottom of the pasta strainer. So the wire mesh strainer is the seal. And you see that it is holding a gas cap quite comfortably. Obviously, it's also very porous. So this is the effect of the interfacial tension. As you continue pumping air, into the pasta strainer, you will at some point reach a maximum column where its buoyancy pressure equals the interfacial tension. <coughs> at which point, it's going to blow. However, there's a hysteresis behavior in this phenomenon, and it doesn't blow the whole column it only blows about half of it, at which point it will stabilize, as you see here, and the seal gets reestablished. So the challenge then you have to evaluate, well, let me back up and say, so what one of the things this illustrates is that quite often people think of seal as a yes-no question. Do I have a seal on my prospect? And that's only half of the evaluation. You have to think it's like an analogy with weather forecasting. Is it going to rain tomorrow, yes or no? If it does rain, how much is it going to rain? So in seal evaluation, is it, is it going to seal, yes or no? And then if it does, what is my column height prediction? And that then is the challenge for the top seal because what you've established is a maximum and you've established a minimum and now you have to make a prediction about where are you really. Okay, uh, another very common uh, seal failure phenomenon is the brittle failure of seals. This, is, uh, this example is from the Barents. And uh, the, the, the brittleness here is because the seal has been deeply buried and the basin has been uplifted. So this is a phenomenon which is also common in a lot of the onshore basins. In this example, what you can see is the flat spot, and you can see that the flat spot seems to be shutting off in the vicinity of the fault planes. 
So what's happening is that because of the uplift, right against the fault plane, you can see that, the, that there's some really intense folding and deformation. And this is what has caused the, the, the failure and fracture of the seal. And the, se and the fault zones are actually zones basically of, of breccia, of rubble. And these have been drilled and, and there's, there's nice, nice analog studies about it. Now the challenge in evaluating this kind of seal is that even though we all know what we mean by the word brittle, there is nothing you can measure for brittleness, right? Elasticity, you have Young's modulus for comp you know, compressibility, you have the bulk modulus, you have LeMay's constant, you have a number of these kind of physical properties that you can measure. There is no measure for brittle. What you have to do is infer the brittle behavior from something which is sort of related to it. <coughs> so you can sort of guess it based on the density, guess it based on Young's modulus, elasticity, different kinds of indicators, but it's all very inferential and none of it actually has a theoretical component to match against this concept that we call brittle. So this is a, a real challenge in how do you apply this. <coughs> Uh, another phenomenon which is common is hydrofracture of the seal. Um, this is, is a little bit different from, from fracking things in unconventionals. What you're talking about here is where excess geopressure combined with the buoyancy of your column is, is, is fracturing the seal, but you're fracturing a ductile seal not a brittle seal. So it's really part of the phenomenon is part like fracture and part of, of the phenomenon is, is like a capillary pressure seal. It's, it's like a foot in each camp. Um, in terms of, of just empiricism, uh, when the amount of geopressure increases and your pressure trend moves further and further to the right, when the, the amount of geopressure only gives you about 750 PSI of headroom, you begin to see seal failures. Uh, this uh, analog is uh, from the, uh, the North Sea again. You can tell I worked in Europe a long time. A lot of my examples are from there. And you can see that once you get down to about 750 PSI of headroom, about half of the wells are dry holes. Again, the challenge, though, is half of them are not. And because it has a foot in each camp in terms of, of its physics, the idea is that, that there's a kind of pressure valve behavior on the fracking. That again, as you begin to vent and drop the pressure, at some point it's going to reseal and allow the structure to recharge if the charge system is still being active. Uh, this is uh, uh, wells in the HPHT play from, uh, again, the, the North Sea. And if you were fully recharged, you'd lie along this line. And what you can see is we have just a big scatter of fields which have different degrees of recharge. So again, the, the challenge in this mechanism is, again, predicting what kind of column height you expect in your prospect. In uh, looking at the fault seals, there are, are a couple of main phenomenon. Uh, one is uh, to have shale drape on the fault plane. Uh, this is also upon occasion, well, okay. The, the, the phenomenon here is not fault drag, although it is sometimes called that, What's really happening is in the very early stages of fault initiation, when you have a uh, alternation of brittle and ductile members, that you get initial cracks, fractures in the brittle sands, brittle members, 
but they line up in a kind of on echelon fashion. And the ductal members form then monoclinal <coughs> folds within this on echelon system. <clears throat> As you then displace it, those monoclinal fold limbs get smeared out and we end up then with a big shale smear on the fault plane. So here's a, a real example of this kind of thing. This is the Braga field in Norway. And what we have is an oil accumulation trapped against the fault, against a water wet reservoir. And what we've done is, is smeared that shale down the fault plane. And the well that went through the fault plane found 20 feet of shale. <coughs> Now the challenge in this phenomenon is there are rules of thumb for saying, okay, <clears throat> I have a shale, I'm gonna smear it out. At some point of displacement, that smear is, is gonna, gonna break. I'm gonna develop holes in it and now be able to leak across the fault plane and no longer have, have seal. <clears throat> and as it, as I said, there are rules of thumb for predicting when that is going to happen. Unfortunately, you don't really have any kind of firm rules for where is it going to happen. But then it gets very complicated as soon as I start to say I have more than one shale because the rules of thumb are going to depend upon the thickness of the shale, the plasticity of the shale to start with, and I now have a, start to have a much more complicated model of multiple shales with, multi, with different rules behind them. And they're going to start developing holes which may or may not line up. So I have to play a very complicated statistical game to make my predictions. And as one of the guys from Chevron said, boy, I wish I had a piece of software to do this for me. Uh, there isn't one, so which makes it very difficult. Uh, the other phenomenon is, is fault seal against a clay-rich fault gouge. The uh, technique here is to <coughs> estimate the clay content by a, a thing called the shale gouge ratio. And that's a very simplistic kind of number where for any point on the fault plane, we simply go and sum up the thickness of shale which has moved past that point as a fraction of what is the total amount of throw. Now, as you can see, this is a really simplistic kind of measurement. And if I go back and you just look at the color variation within the gouge, you'd be right to object and say, that's an awfully heterogeneous looking gouge and you've taken a really super simple approach. And how do you justify doing that? Well, I justify doing it because actually the basis is purely empirical. This is one of the, f this is out of one of the very few things that Shell has actually published on the work they've done. And what you're seeing here is on, oops, is on this axis, this is the shale gouge ratio, the estimate of clay content, and this is actually column height on this axis, and each one of these data points is the measurement of what is the column retained on a fault which is juxtaposing sand against sand in a very wide variety of plays. And what's apparent is that there is one thing out of this you think that you can predict and predict with some degree of confidence. And that is for any particular sh estimate of the shale clay content, this SGR number, there seems to be a, a, a reliable maximum or P1 column that you can associate with it. Then, if you know the P1, and if you're willing to make some assumptions and think you can analyze the, the 
P50 trend in that distribution. And if you assume that this is a log normal distribution, you notice I'm now making a series of assumptions, then by being log normal, I only need to know, have two spots because it's a straight line. So I can now make my predictions on what the column heights are like. Now, I think a cynic would be perfectly justified in saying, now wait a minute. You've already told me that the state of the art lacks uh, rigor. Thank you. And we're making an awful lot of assumptions and there's an awful lot of uncertainties here. Aren't you really just blowing smoke? And, and my answer would be, yeah, except for the problem that as, as evaluators, nevertheless, we have to deliver to decision makers our quantification of risk and our quantification of column height. Whether or not there's uncertainty in this, I still have to deliver these numbers. I don't have any choice. That's what I'm being paid for. And so this brings me then to, to anybody who knows me and worked with me to some quotes I use very, very frequently. All models are wrong, but some are useful. So if I take the example of the fault seal and shale gouge ratio, I have a fairly reliable number on the P1 column height. If somebody's showing me a prospect and they're telling me their guess as to the column height and it's bigger than that number, well, isn't my P1 then a useful estimate to have, even though it carries still a fair amount of uncertainty? Takes me then to the, 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 the second quote from George, uh, George Box. How wrong does it have to be to stop being useful? So the, 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 the deliverable of seal analysis is not to try to deliver the absolute answer. Instead, it's an effort to try to deliver a better answer. And that's what we can do. Now, where do, you, where do you start to do SEAL evaluation? And I would say the place you really have to start is with empiricism. And when I was a young punk, graduate student, doing field work in Arkansas, I uh, was irritating a, 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 a older geologist at an outcrop by pestering him and arguing him about the origin of what we were seeing. And his answer to me was, boy, I don't need to explain it as long as I can photograph it. <laughs> and, and I actually took that me message to heart. I did learn something that day. Not about the outcrop, but about ge science. And, and he's right. That, that sometimes, you know, we, we can go trying to explain things and theorizing, but, but there's nothing like empiricism. What you see is what you get, just like in this photograph, and I don't know what that is either. <laughs> so where you always really want to try to start is with some kind of a play look back, if you can. You really have to know your play, and if you don't know your play, I would argue you shouldn't be in it in the first place. You know, you want to look at the dry holes and the success cases, what's going on with them, if seal failure is, is a common phenomenon in your play, what kind of seal failure? What is, what is the mechanism? What's going wrong? You want to define what that is. You want to have statistics. How many of these are failing? What are the limits? What kind of quantification can you put on it? Uh, you would never ever walk in to a prospect review, talk about the reservoir without having measured the, the porosity, permeability, net to gross, thickness, some kind of you know, distribution in a map sense of what the facies are doing. Why ever would you walk in and talk about seal without having the same thing? The density of the shale, the clay content of the shale, the siltiness, the thickness, uh, 
you know, what are the factors which are appropriate to your failure mechanism? Just to give some examples of the kind of things that you can, can derive and back out of, of play lookbacks. Uh, this is from uh, Malaysia. And top seal, its capacity is a function of its compaction. So as you go deeper, you can hold higher and higher columns. And the interfacial tension is a function of the composition of the hydrocarbon. So gas will leak at much lower pressures than oil. Therefore, there is a simple trend with depth. Oops, keep on pushing the wrong button. Simple trend with depth dividing a field where we have oil only in our traps versus oil and gas or oil and gas caps in our traps. Simply from the behavior of the top seal. Another example is I said you want to compile statistics. Sort of a more fun example of statistics. This is from uh, Norway. Is I'm frequently were asked, uh, I see chimneys in my seismic data. Is this good news or bad news? And of course the answer is yes. Uh, and here the, the real answer though is it depends where the chimneys are. And where do they sit with respect to your prospect? And here they've compiled uh, statistics uh, on that subject uh, showing what is the discovery rates based on where the chimneys are sitting. Uh, you can, of course, define the, the you want to define the, 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 quantify the properties of your seals. You can do this if you're lucky enough to actually have samples. Uh, logs. You can also at times back out the properties from the look back. Uh, so this is a case uh, uh, from the UK sector where again the capacity of the seal improves as you go deeper and deeper. It gets more and more compacted and therefore there is a, a, a definable limit of the seal capacity just based on the drilling results. Uh, similar kind of thing here for fault seal. This is from Thailand. Uh, they did a similar exercise as Shell had done, uh, calibrating uh, held columns against fault planes. And again, this nicely defines what is the maximum P1 column that you can have. Another question is not only what do you know about your seal, but where do you know it? So in this case, what we're showing is that the seal capacity has a range, and of course it's a function primarily of compaction, but also of siltiness of fabric, and relates to the facies of the sealing shale. Therefore, if you can relate it to the seal facies, and I have a facies map, I could relabel it and recolor it as a seal capacity map. And depending on where my prospect is, I now have a completely different measurement of what my predicted hydrocarbon column is going to be. So you want to see these also in map form to see if there are any trends that you have to be paying attention to. And last but not least, of course, then I want to compare what do I really know about my seal with my prospect. In this particular example, what I have on the left is a uh, proven uh, field where the J1, 2, 3 sands are all pay sands. And we can see I have a very nice shale top seal to the package. On the right, I have an undrilled sand in the same play. How does this compare? And I picked this on particular because what I'm comparing here is the seismic stratigraphy of the top seal. 
And as you see, the one on the right has a very different seismic, it's the same seismic uh, survey, by the way. So I'm mixing apples and apples. It has a very different seismic appearance than in the proven field. So what does that mean? Well, it has been drilled. And those are the logs. And as you can see, the prospect is a very silty top seal as opposed to the proven play. So I want to go comparing my quantification, but comparing all kinds of different kinds of factors other than saying, well, I have a shale. Now, my advice is how do you use this in risking is to really steal a little bit from uh, the DHI consortium. Probably a bunch of you are familiar with it. And the way the they use their philosophy is to say, all right, I have a DHI or what I think is a DHI, but I'm actually going to start assigning risk by looking at the geologic factors. And then after I and I'm going to ignore the fact that I have a DHI. And I assign a risk based on the geologic factors. And then I will adjust that risk upwards or downwards based on my analysis of the DHI. And I would recommend the same kind of thing for seal evaluation. That I would look at my statistics and that would get me started And then I will adjust it up or down based on the results of my seal evaluation. Now, a part of best practice that also says we're really lousy at assigning risk numbers. We're really bad at it. What we find though in practice is that if we get away from the number and we start to try to assign words you know, possible, unlikely, probable, likely. And if we wrap a few kind of definitions around those words, in practice what we see is that then the assembled geologists and geophysicists actually pretty easily and pretty quickly get to a consensus on how do they see the risk of this prospect. And then from there, then go back and say, okay, once we agree on the words, then go and see what the number is. That's what best practice is. Another thing to keep in mind is that instead of being scared off by all of the uncertainty in it, we actually should consider the uncertainty as part of the input to the risking process. That if you think about it, if I have really high confidence in my analysis and in what the analysis means, then that should allow me to polarize good, bad, yes, no. If I have lower confidence in my evaluation, and I'm admitting that we have low confidence in the seal evaluation, but if I have lower confidence, this also then is limiting me to where within this risk matrix I can be sitting. Because if I have low confidence in what the results mean, then I can't be definitively positive or definitively negative. And that's, I guess, the philosophical basis behind this. So, uh, this is my crusade trying to, to get a little awareness, get a little discussion. Um, I thank you very much for, for taking the, the time to come listen to me. And if you have questions, I, I'll be very, very happy to entertain them. And I took exactly 45 minutes. <laughs>